so in like the first episode or the second episode you were talking about how people said you had spoiled them like spoiled like Zeke's name for them or something like that Mm -hmm. and me and my brother were listening and we were like no she did it like his name we're a subtitle household by the way so maybe this is why but his name pops up like in the third season when they're sitting on the wall and talking it pops up and says Zeke so like for anyone that like has subtitles we knew his name already and there was already connection made that like Zeke had told on um I'm blanking on Aaron's dad's name Grisha Grisha. yeah Zeke had told on Grisha there was already that connection that was like kind of already made so I don't want you like I was like no one said it yet but I want to be like as a friend I want to say like you didn't spoil anything for anybody with that whole name reveal (laughs) Because I was like, oh, this is a, I was, cause you know, I'm like, this is a big deal, but I just felt like we had found that out. I'm like, we know this kind of, right? Like we definitely found out that that man's name was Zeke. Yes. Um, because even back in the day, when I first started making my videos about season three, I was like, I couldn't remember his name, but I remembered that they had told us his name, but okay. That was good. That was good. Duncan. That was good. I okay. was holding on that one for forever. I was like, I just, I just, if I ever make it to the podcast, I just want to put it out there so the world knows. everybody how are you feeling um i really hope all of my folks that are experiencing real winter i mean you know the snow freezing cold blocks of ice and all i really hope y'all are doing okay i'm not over it yet but it is quickly approaching but we are here with another episode of big titan talk with your girl the anime nay and today i'm joined by a very special guest one of my beautiful pals from college, the old college days, Buckeyes over here. Everybody welcome Duncan to the pod. Welcome Duncan. Hey everyone. <laughs> <laughs> so Duncan, you are a creator, an actor, an actor, and <laughs> you're also a podcast host yourself. Your podcast is called We're Watching, We're Rewatching and We're talking um and right now you guys are going over shit's creek yes so yeah um the premise of the podcast is basically we take completed stories and we go back and visit them and see where we were when we watched them and then how we feel about them now so um yeah it was something that came to me after shit's creek ended and i was just looking for friends <laughs> to be like hey does anyone want to talk about this so yeah it's a a good time yeah and I mean it's great that you got that you're taking it after it's completed because so many of these well thought out stories and narratives when you look back you're like oh Mm -hmm. that came up in this season that came up in that season so I think that's a really cool idea Mm -hmm. um Shit's Creek let me just sing my phrases of that show it's so good (laughs) it's um I I love it. I was telling my friend Kaylin that it this is like you know how people are will rewatch Friends or The Office or How I Met Your Mother or whatever. This this show is that for me. I have gone back and rewatched episodes five, seven, eight, ten times. Not just for my podcast, but quite literally for my sole enjoyment. Like I am upset. Obsessed? Oh, we're gonna say obsessed with the show. Um, and I felt like I've never, the stories that are being told, I've never had them told to me this way before. Um, a disenfranchised, very rich family, or not disenfranchised family, a very rich family becomes quote unquote disenfranchised. And they themselves are very eclectic characters and have to go into this um, or have to live in this town that they bought as a joke way back when. And hijinks ensues, right? Like you, 
there's and it's not just kind of like a one episode's done it doesn't matter it's like what happens in episode two of season one has affected what has happened in episode four of season four and being able to go back and just see myself in these characters not only the the roses the main family but the people of the town. I see myself in Stevie or I see myself in Jocelyn. Um, definitely see myself in Ronnie at times. They're being able to just see those little things and then apply it to myself. And then, wow, like, wow I've never heard this story told this way. I, I just, I really like it. I'm really nerdy about it. <laughs> I, <don't know. laughs> I feel like there are some times where I'm like rambling about something and I'm talking to a friend and they're just like, but it's not that deep. And I'm like, but to me it is, to me it is, it is so deep. It is the, it's my lifeblood. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, especially in these uncertain times where everything's gone crazy. Um, people don't know how to stay home and wash their hands and take care of themselves or wear a mask. And we're not gonna get into the government all right now, yeah. but listen. <laughs> but listen. <laughs> I don't want I don't want your podcast to get flagged as any type of right, they don't come for me. They don't come for me. <laughs> but anyway, all that to say, like it's my it's my it's a great escape for me. Um I really enjoy it. And another portion of the podcast, I do cover movies. Um I tackled the whole MCU with my best friend Alex over Christmas. And uh we did 23 movies in 12 days. So it kind of like set the tone of how I want the podcast to go. That's where all of my like my real rough, rough drafts lie. So as I really like go through and edit and release those episodes, I'm always listening back like, man, I really was struggling. Like we didn't know what we were doing. We were really trying to figure things out. So it's fun listening back now and hearing the growth, but I, I don't know. I still get that secondhand embarrassment or that embarrassment of like <laughs> listening to myself and being like, did I say that? Why did I, why did I make that argument and not this argument? I start arguing with myself. <laughs> I'm like, right. I'm an idiot. Like it's. No, literally. It's like, is that what I think? Did I say that? <laughs> is that how I feel about this show? I don't know. But no, I feel you on, I mean, that's, that's literally how I feel about Attack on Titan. You know, sometimes I'm like, Lynette, it's not that serious. Chill out. And then I'm like, no, this story is epic. Everyone needs to watch this. I'm learning so much about the human existence. Like literally for me, Attack on Titan is that thing that I just am blown away by the story. But before we even get into that, Shit's Creek. <laughs> I, not me bringing it back to Shit's Creek, but I have to. Yes. Like, Daniel Levy for me is hilarious. Genius. Genius. I'm like him and his dad in this show. Hilarious. Okay. His character gets me every time. One of the funniest moments. I did I haven't finished the show and okay. I need to go back and finish it. But the funniest moment for me, I think it was the beginning of season two. I want to say it might have been the first episode or maybe the end of season one mm -hmm. where um, his character, David, is in like this field and he has his outfit on and he looks like a crow. Yes, it's the beginning of season two. <laughs> yes, season two, he looks like a one. crow. That was hilarious. Like they're in the, they're getting out the car like, David, come on. And he's like, no, like that <laughs> was hilarious like if, if anyone out there is looking for quality television because I'm all about a story like I mm. love animes I have good story just anything um movies tv shows whatever Shit's Creek amazing I I love it it has my favorite love storyline I think in current with the exception of Insecure I, th mm -hmm. I think Shit's Creek has my favorite love storyline currently running um or not currently running because it's over but um yeah it's the <laughs> it has my favorite love storyline but yeah this this show oh man oh there's so much there so much about like life relationships friendships uh no work. seriously and of course that is how we feel about um crazy ass aot yes uh <laughs> So I wanted to ask you, what are you watching currently, anime-wise? Anime-wise. Uh, currently, I am watching, well, I, I am a manga guy. 
However, um, I do I, I do this weird thing where I will start out with the anime. And then if I like the anime enough, I'll go look for the manga and then start reading from where like the last episode or so. So right now, manga wise, what I am reading is One Piece. I am reading uh, My Hero Academia. Uh, I got into solo leveling, uh, which is a, a, a webtoon technically, it's okay. Korean. Uh, so I got into that, that's really fun. Um, anime wise, like, as I'm like I'm watching and trying to like get a, a ground of myself, uh, The Promised Neverland. And what else was I watching? Oh, I tried to start watching The Great Pretender, which is on Netflix. Mm -hmm. um, the Promised Neverland and The Great Pretender are kind of like a genre shift for me, kind of, because mm -hmm. okay. it's not necessarily, I'm going to go fight this guy. And right. It, it, my intro in the anime was quite literally Sailor Moon and um, Dragon Ball Z. So right. if, if no one's shooting an energy blast out of their hand for a long time, it took me a while to get into it. But I, I, I mean, I've I've dipped into different genres before. Growing up, I used to watch Hamtaro uh, on Tsunami. I used to watch um, Case Closed, which in the Japanese translation is Detective Conan, but the American translation was Case Closed. But either way, um, really enjoyed that. Follows Conan at Agawa, who got who was a junior detective and got turned back into a kid for because of a drug. Really cool concept. He solves all these murders. It's how I was introduced to Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata, by the way. Ooh. There was a lot I just threw. <laughs> there, okay, there was a oh lot of God. different places. But um, yeah, that's, so yeah, uh, I, I love anime. I've watched a lot of Gundam, um, Zoids, Yu-Gi-Oh, Pokemon, Duel Masters, Metabots. Inuyasha has a um a spinoff that just came yeah, out recently. Yeah, Yasha Hime. Have you been watching it? I have not. I need to start, but that is one that I am. Yeah, I saw the first episode and I was like, this is so good. I, for some reason, thought Yasha Hime was a movie. Like I saw the little uh, promo for it and I was, I thought it was a movie that was dropping. So I watched the first mm -hmm. episode and I was like, shook. I was like, why is it only 30 minutes? And I realized it was a series. So I definitely want to go back and watch that for sure. Um, how do you feel about, okay, I don't want to get too deep into Promise Neverland because I feel like we could definitely go with there, but <laughs> how are you feel? Are you watching the new season? No, I'm still in season one. Okay. It's a, okay. It's a slow burn for me. Um, how do you I feel wanna... about it? So much. There's so much. Um, <laughs> so much. I, I like it. I like the concept of it. I think I'm not a big horror person. So these horror animes, i.e. Attack on Titan, took a while for me to get into for that aspect. Also Attack on Titan was took me a while to get into for other reasons. <laughs> but um, yeah, The Promised Neverland, I think is, a, is one where I, I wanna sit down and focus on what's happening because I feel like there's so much in each scene that if you casually watch it, like I can casually watch One Piece and be fine. Like as long as I catch, you know, one or two lines, you can kind of hold an episode, um, unless it's like a Absolutely. world building episode. But the promise never mind. I feel like there's so much. So like, for instance, just so you have a frame of reference where I'm at, I just figured out who the spy was. Like they just okay. announced who the spy was. And that kind of threw me but like, as they're going back and explaining things, I'm like, well, why didn't I see that from this point? Da, da, da. Right. But like, hindsight's always 2020. No, I totally agree. Promise Neverland is definitely one of those shows you have to pay attention. I mean, literally you need to read those subtitles, put your phone down, pay attention. Um, like you said, One Piece, I definitely was in and out of One Piece. I'm, oh shoot, that's right, I'm watching One Piece. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, let me get back to paying attention. Um, but yeah, Promise Neverland is something, it's something else. I I will say though, I was one of those people that when I first watched, when I watched the first season, I wasn't totally with it. I thought it was good. Um, but I kind of wasn't really looking forward to a season two, but now that I'm in season two, mm -hmm. I actually really like it a lot. So I'm excited to see how you feel about it as the story progresses. I definitely want to know what your thoughts are on that. Mm -hmm. um, 
so let me ask you who is your favorite aot character who are you vibing with right now oh this is a multifaceted answer um who do if i live in the aot world who do i have a crush on john but i texted you about that <laughs> <laughs> i texted you about that that time skit did him wonders uh but who Absolutely. do i, I <laughs> Who do I actually love as a character? It's between Hanji and um, yeah, Mikasa, Mikasa. Um, those are my two. I like Hanji because I love a crazy mad scientist vibe. She really is passionate, right? Yeah. Uh, Kurosichi from Bleach was one of my favorite characters, and so was Kisuke. And it was because they were calculated but eccentric in their own way. Mm -hmm. um Kurosichi more than Kisuke but I think that's what I get when I get when I see Hanji and I really like that feel it was that familiarity I think that just made me like gravitate towards her um Mika Saka because I love a overshadowed character because we're worried about telling the main character story but the overshadowed character seems to be infinitely better uh it's why I like Kilua more than I like Gon it's why, um, who else is there? Oh, Kai from Digimon I felt was more interesting than, no, not Kai, Matt from Digimon I thought was more interesting than Kai. Uh, all these things. Like, I, I don't know, I feel like because I, like, also her story was dark. Yeah. And very depressing, but like her loyalty, like, I don't know, I just, I, I appreciate it. I agree. And I mean, they're both strong as hell, intuitive, mm -hmm. smart. I mean, Hanji to me is like the ultimate, I don't want to say warrior, but truly she's smart as hell. Mm -hmm. And watching her fight, I want to say it was like season, the, the beginning of season three. Was that when Kenny the Ripper, when all that was happening? Yeah, I think it was the yes. first time of season three. Um, watching her come out and just be a badass I was like this woman is one of my faves so yeah I'm definitely feeling her honestly I love all of the scouts like I think mm -hmm. it took for us to meet all the Marleyans and again I have I mean not the Marleyans but the Eldians who live in Marley I do mm -hmm. have a soft spot in my heart for them I can't help it but mm -hmm. everybody at Paradise Island love them literally love them even Connie you know Obviously, I didn't love him as much as Sasha, but I still love him. And I actually, I think I still would have been a little sad if it was him who would have got shot too, because even yeah. everything that happened with his mom, I still yeah. feel slightly unresolved about that. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, I feel like there's just so many characters to choose from, but I feel you with, I literally have a, a Mikasa poster in my room because <laughs> I'm like, that lady is bomb. Yeah. How do you feel about Aaron at this point? Oh, God. Uh, Aaron is, he's difficult to love, but he's also difficult to hate, right? Mm -hmm. um, your guest last week, I'm sorry, I forgot his name. Sh Shango. Shango. Mm -hmm. um, he brought up a good point that like, yeah, Aaron's traumatized, but so is everyone else. Like yeah. quite literally everyone else is traumatized from that day too. And you're right, you don't know who saw their parents get eaten by Titans or saw were crushed from the falling debris one way or the other. So yeah, I, I think I think Aaron's selfish, which makes me not want to like him, but I also kind of get where like he's determined, right? And so I can't fault him for being determined to find a better life or like have yeah. a better life. Or fight for a better life. We're gonna get to more about him, but I have some thoughts. <laughs> I have been thinking about this man because, okay, the theme for me this week in this episode was, is everybody slowly descending into madness, okay? Every single person seemed to be troubled and bothered as hell. <laughs> Everyone is going through it, but okay, let's let's get into it. But I will tell you to start off, this episode for some reason was so confusing to me at first. I watched it and I was a little lit when I first watched it, not gonna lie. So I was like, 
I watched it and was like, what the hell is going on? Like, literally what the hell is going on? At first, I thought we were seeing, um, like, post when they made it back to Parody. Mm-hmm. And, like, there was a, a Marley ship, uh, or maybe even not even, I don't even know if I thought it was a Marley ship, but some type of ship in general mm-hmm. coming to do their first attack. But then I realized, like, oh, no, this is back in the day. Mm-hmm. when they first were sending Marley ship. So that was cleared up. But now that I watched it a few times, I think I think I'm on the right page, but okay, cool. Let's get into it. This show is crazy. We have gotten, well, now that we know more, we are getting not just one coup, but two overthrows of a government in under 70 episodes of a show. You know, we got the anti Marleyan volunteers. The resistance is not over, people. Okay. The resistance is not over. And wait, can we like talk about that? They're also, or I'm sure you're going to talk about it, but like they're led by Zeke. <laughs> they're led by Zeke, homie. I told, I, first off, I told <laughs> everybody, okay. I didn't want to straight up say that Zeke was a good guy. And we still don't, re- I mean, I, I guess we can't say he's a good guy, but yeah. I that Zeke wasn't just straight up I don't give a care about anybody but myself like I just I I I was like I knew it I knew it but yes they're led by Zeke they're led by Zeke um Yelena uh is amazing I love her um very determined individual I really Mm -hmm. appreciate the fact that she's for the mission however there were some scenes with her where I felt like, oh no, we have a zealot on our hands. Like the second things don't go how it's made in her mind, she's going to snap. And the reason why I say that is because when she's thinking or talking about the beast Titan or talking about Zeke and she's talking mm. about how like, oh, this is God and da 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 or gifts from God, one of the two. And like how she looks afterwards, in all of the anime I've watched throughout my life, that is the same look that, the look that I can equate it to, and this is, God, I'm such a nerd. But the look that I'm equated to is um, when, in Yu-Gi-Oh, when Merrick descends into darkness and gives into his millennium millennium item and becomes Dark Merrick. Um, this may not mean a lot to a lot of people, but I hope it means something to someone out there. <laughs> uh, that is the same look I got. Like, it is... Yelena is technically like teetering in the shadow realm at all points in time. And she is about to descend into full madness. All it takes is one thing for like her to fall into complete madness. Uh, She got a black man with her though. And that's dope. Um, Representation matters. But I mean, Yelena, (laughs) see, she was giving me like Mikasa vibes for a little bit. But the Mm -hmm. thing is, is I feel like the difference and that like the subtle thing between the two is Yelena only has Zeke right like for her Zeke is that thing and I feel like if something ever happens to Zeke if she is gonna snap or you know but I feel like Mikasa now has Connie she has Jean she has Levi she has all of these people to kind of like and Armin you know to keep Mm -hmm. her from going further into that dark place but yeah no and yes we got a black guy so exciting that's amazing Ooh, yeah. and we're gonna talk about that too that moment you know what i'm talking about in the show mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> um but to the mikasa point uh mm-hmm. she did lose it that one time right she did descend into madness when she thought aaron was dead oh and that's right yes yes you're right and so it's almost like this is yelena is mikasa but what was, it, what was that four years ago five years mm-hmm. ago now so does she have that growth period does but at the same time does she have the support around her right because like jean and and sasha rest in peace and um connie they were all ready to like swarm around mikasa to tell her like everything is going to be okay right does yelena have that at this point are they going to build that are they I think they're going to use her as, I think she's going to snap. Like, I feel like they're going to use her character. And I I can foresee um, them using her character to do some real damage. We haven't seen her fight, but I mean, that's one stallion of a woman. So you don't got that haircut for no reason. I feel Mm -hmm. like she'll go in (laughs) if she needs to. 
they they pointed out that she is tall and i was like i'm glad someone said it because how she t- as she towers over everyone 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 just I mean, wow. and her confidence too like when they were um when they showed up and she's like i would love to have tea i'm like oh y'all are chilling y'all are in straight up enemy territory right now you're just relaxed she's but composure man okay so with this whole the the confirmation that there is a resistance against marley mm-hmm. has really confused things for me in terms of mm-hmm. like even just thinking about the rest of the show who is it is it aaron against Marley? Is it mm-hmm. Eldians against Marley? Is it some Eldians against Marley or against the world? Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, what is this battle gonna be about? And so I think this goes into the end of season three where Aaron's in the water and he's looking out and he's saying, mm-hmm. once we beat Marley, who else is out there? Who else right. is out there for us to beat? So I do think it is some Eldians against the world. And I don't think they're all aligned. I think some are, and as we see, like even within the, I'm, I'm gonna call the hearing that it was for uh, Zeke's plan, even within there, you can tell like there's dissent among the generals, right? And heaven forbid something happened to Pixis, but if it does, like it really will go to shit because he is the only one like really anchoring the military force right now because Hanji nor Levi have the pull. Right. Um, as that scene show. And so I think I think for Aaron, it is Eldians against the world. For Zeke, it is probably Eldians against the world, and their faction is Eldians against the world. However, I feel like there are people in Parody that are like, if we can go outside the walls, we can go outside the walls, cool, great. But we don't need the rest of the the world, right? If Marley mm-hmm. still wants to be a problem, we'll go against Marley. But we don't need to go do anything else. And I feel like there's a real conquistador um, attitude with Zeke and Aaron where they're like, no, Eldians shall rule and we shall have all. Mm -hmm. And you know, that that just speaks to the the power of these Titans. I feel Mm -hmm. like once these Titans are entered into your body, once you turn into a Titan and eat one of the Titan variants, I just feel like it changes your personality. And I kind of, I mean, obviously I hope that we see more about Zeke's backstory and how he got to where he is right now, but Mm -hmm. something, I feel like, you know, Zeke might've been on one path in life and I don't know if it's because he got the beast Titan or what happened, but I feel like something in him made him realize that he really fucked up, you know, like he literally is doing the job that his dad was doing. He's doing the job that he essentially murdered his father for you know what I'm Mm -hmm. saying like his dad Grisha was ahead of this um I don't remember what it was called back in the day but you know the old Mm anti-Marlian faction whatever and Zeke ruined all of that and again he was a kid so how can you really blame him he doesn't know any better and we've seen um from from generation to generation Grisha's dad nailed into him. This is what you have to be. This is how you have to act in Marley. Mm-hmm. Don't change it. And then Grisha's like, this is how it is to be an Eldian. You need to fight for this cause. We're making you do this thing. And then, you know, Zeke flies off the rails. And now we have Aaron in the same situation. So mm-hmm. I feel like something happened to Zeke and it might've been him getting his beast Titan that really kind of changed his mind. Um, but man, oh man, it is hard because it's like, really, how can you come back from that, Zeke? I guess his, they talked about that in the episode, how his main goal is retrieving the founding Titan. But this man literally killed hundreds of people. <laughs> he murdered hundreds of people. Yeah. I felt like mm, all of this could have been settled with a nice conversation. <laughs> I know it doesn't make for great anime, but like, especially from... Zeke's standpoint, being the Beast Titan, I felt like, well, no, because Levi's always been to chop him up on site. So never mind. I was like, you know, like it could have been like a parlay type situation where he could have came out of the Beast Titan or something, or like, you know, kind of like a meeting of the mind, send send word through someone or absolutely. And it it would have been I don't know. I just, I feel, I'm still a little caught up on how, like, 
95% of the scout regiment was wiped out by Zeke. So like- But you know what though? This is the thing though. In my mind, it's literally shifting as we have this conversation right now. In my mind, Zeke being in Paradise Island and him revealing that he's the head of this, you know, uh, anti-Marley faction and all that stuff. I'm like, okay, cool. So he's technically kind of on Paradise Island side, but no, I low-key think that Zeke still does not give a damn about anyone on Paradise Island still. And I honestly feel like he his goal really is a founding Titan, but he's like, the only way for me to get this Titan is to just cooperate and do what I need to do because even thinking back to season three, because when we found all of this out in season four and this past mm-hmm. episode about Zeke, I was like, but low key though, he was ruthless. And even when we think to the moment when he killed all of those, um, when he killed everybody, mm-hmm. all of the scouts, and the moment we are hearing the Beast Titans, there was like a moment we're hearing his inner dialogue, his inner monologue or whatever, and Levi's coming, approaching side of him. Mm-hmm. We're hearing his inner dialogue. And he was saying like, you know, some pretty bad stuff about them. I don't remember exactly, but yeah. I do remember him being like, I'm, I don't care about any of these people. Like, look at them. They're, these poor fools just running mm-hmm. to their death. Like, come on, I'm about to still kill y'all. And I'm thinking about it. Like, I honestly feel like his main goal is help all Eldians, mm-hmm. but he might honestly low-key still feel some type of way about all the people in Paradise Island. I want to know what the criteria was for making it to Paradise Island. You know, like mm-hmm. why did the king bring only certain people? Like really what was it that made these people so special or whatever, like this group of folks that got to go? And he could probably still feel some type of way about that. Um but didn't he, wasn't it said that, like, the king, because they split, right? Like, the Eldians, like, split in beliefs. And so the people that chose to follow the king mm. ended up on parody. And then okay. everyone else that stayed were like, no, nah, we're going to conform or whatever to Marley and Marleyism? Marleyism? Uh, anyway, the Marley ideal. And so. But why would you choose that? I mean, maybe they didn't know they would be in internment camps, but why yeah. would you? Why would I you yeah, I feel like it wasn't packaged the way like it is now. I feel like it was definitely like a, yeah, things will be fine. And then all of a sudden, boop. Yeah. You're in an internment yeah. camp and you have to wear armbands and you can't go outside these limits and we're going to control your rations and all these things. Um, quite frankly, I don't, I think last week was the shift when I realized like I don't really care for Marleyans. Not, not necessarily the Eldians on Marley, but specifically the Marleyans, right? Because through this week's episode, you also realize like they were the ones deciding to rage war or try to have rule over everyone. Like mm-hmm. not even just parody, but everyone else too. And that's mm-hmm. why their enemies came together once they found out that the Titans can be beaten. And so for me, it's like, oh, well, Marley, like the Marleyans specifically just got greedy and they felt like they could do something and now they're being checked. So I don't really care what happens to them. Like when it first, when Armin first shows up and kills all those people, when I first saw them, I was like, oh, that's sad. And they, you know, they cut to like, children and grandparents and parents or whatever. And I'm like, now looking back at that scene, I, I don't really care. It sounds terrible to say, I don't care though. <laughs> like, I don't care for them. I'm kind of like, uh, you deserve it at this point. Like, it's a weird, like sins of the father type situation where these people, these specific people didn't do anything wrong. That's true. However, they supported and stood by ideals that have cost thousands of lives. So it was your time to pay. Like I, that was kind of like my stance on it. And so as for Zeke and his indifference, I think that was more so the brainwashing Mm -hmm. and there's so much unlearning he has to do. And I feel like as we're going through the episodes and I could be wrong. I mean, this man doesn't have long to live. He's down to months at this point, right? Right. So I don't want to say like, I think he's trying to unlearn and like rectify everything. I do think he is trying to 
Well, I do think he's trying to unlearn, but I still think he is, like you said earlier, self-serving. Like he's unlearning certain things, but it's still kind of like, all right, and as I unlearn, I'm going to shift more towards LDN reparation versus reparations as the whole, like Mm -hmm. for everyone involved. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, um... Man, so, so much because LDNs are hated everywhere. Yeah. And, you know, we'll focus on Marley because, like you said, you brought up the good point of Marley is trying to rule everything. Mm-hmm. You know, they're at war with all these different countries because they're trying to be the world power. Mm-hmm. And, whoa, let's just take a moment to even, when the hell did Attack on Titan even, <laughs> like, bring all of that in you know we again we were trying to get historia to be the queen Mm -hmm. and forget all that we're talking about world power now um and it's just so interesting because my thought was okay so this is kind of jumping forward but toward the end of the Mm -hmm. episode when armin's talking to annie and he says like you know we there's no chance for peace now we did what we did but we had to do that and you know i'm more on the side of i think they had to do it too but at the same time i was thinking about this like could the ldns have appeal to other powers could the ldns have appeal to other countries you know what i'm saying like could they Mm -hmm. have somehow gotten not necessarily protection but some sort of like just some sort of deal or something with another country so that they can get out of marley but Really, I mean, from the looks of the season and from hearing different stuff from, I think his name was Udo or whatever, um, Mm -hmm. Marley probably has the best situation set up for Eldians. Like, we haven't seen how Eldians are treated in other countries, but he mentions that, you know, they're treated pretty poorly. Mm -hmm. So it kind of does feel like it's always going to be Eldians against the world and they're going to be used as pawns in whatever game any country is playing um but it's just it's weird to me because the ldns have and hold all the power in a way because as aaron kind of pointed out armin's like you know we aren't monsters everyone thinks we're scary maybe we can just tell them we're not and aaron's like are we not scary i mean i can turn into a monster can't you like you know what i'm saying like we have that ability so But in my opinion, that's like, that makes you guys strong, you know, like if every single one of the nine Titan variants or whatever, and all Eldians were to be like, we're sticking together. I don't see how they can't win whatever war they're going into. It just doesn't make sense to me to even have Titans fighting Titans, to be honest, at this Mm -hmm. point. But Again, everyone has their own agenda. Everyone has their own home, their own story, their own feelings and sentiments. So I know a lot of people are trying to put that aside. People like Jean, who I used to not really like Jean, or I didn't have any feelings about Jean. I just, I thought it was annoying that him and Aaron were always at odds. I was like, why are you so mad about Aaron? But now I'm just like, we need Jean's character. He's just become this compassionate leader and I'm so happy that he told them, no, we're not going to throw these kids off of this airship. We're not doing that. It's never going to end if we do that. Um, so, yeah, I'm just like, where where do they even where do they even go from here? Seriously, where do they go from it's, here? I, I'm interested to see, like, who all um, who all leads this next. I'm going to guess I'm going to call it an expedition. Right. Because you touched on this last episode where you talk about how they said we won battle one we won the first Mm -hmm. battle so i'm interested to see who leads the next expedition because i feel like that's where we're headed so that's where i feel like we have to head next like it you can't they kind of like kick the proverbial snow snowball down the hill right so like there's no way to back out of what they're doing now they've they've started a war and they have to finish this war and so, well, not, they didn't technically start it, but they chose to engage in this war. So now they have to finish it. Uh, there was a point brought up in the, um, who was it? Was it Mikasa? No, Mikasa was in the, at the cemetery. Sorry, I'm jumping around too. Where did you, okay. is this where you wanna go? Okay, there was a point That's brought up in the, where Mikasa <laughs> was in the cemetery 
And Nicolo is there too. And he's mourning for Sasha. I didn't know who she was necessarily mourning for. She had brought flowers, but I assumed she was going to be at Sasha's grave too, but she wasn't. She was at someone else's grave. Mm, so I didn't good know. Good point. It, good I point. Know, she looked over and saw him at Sasha's grave. Good point. So I didn't know if she was like mourning um, her parents or uh, the the Jaegers, uh, Grisha. I don't think Grisha have a grave. I don't know. So like, um, and also wait, this is short aside. Yeah. Why did Grisha never come back up? Like Grisha just went missing, and then that was it. Have you? Did you notice that? I'm like, no one ever even like said anything about him, but. Anyway, moving on, moving on. That that was uh, something I have been stuck on. Like, but anyway, yes, yeah. yeah, so she was at the grave. So she's at the grave, and a military police officer um, is decides to beat up Nico, Nicola, 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 uh, and Jean and Connie break it up or whatever. And Mikasa comes running over. They have this weird exchange about their relationship. Um, like specifically Sasha and Nicola's Nicola's relationship, where they keep talking about the food, and you know, at one point I'm like, is this supposed to be a euphemism? Like, she ate all my food, but oh my I, god! <laughs> but um, no. The point I want to bring up is the actual exchange between Nicola and Sasha's dad, where okay, yeah it's a contrast like there's one person that even if you are Eldian for Marley you are Marley and Mm -hmm. there's that also that thing of um it doesn't matter if you if you show love to my people I'm gonna show love to you that Sasha's dad had and so I think in my mind yes there's the expedition force or whatever that I'm assuming is going to come forward but I also think there has to be a war against Eldians that has to come to one point, like a true war against Eldians. Like I know we've had Eldians versus Eldians in the past where it's like, they've been sitting Titans and you know, the whole beast Titan, armor Titan, colossal Titan versus the scout regiment. Cool. No, I'm talking like actual Eldians, like take up arms against neighbors and go Mm -hmm. at it against war because it's, I don't know. I feel like it's like laying ground for like a civil war type situation of like they're all Marlians, they're all bad. And then there's people like, no, they're not, they're good people. They've just been conditioned or brainwashed. I don't they don't ever use the word brainwash, but that's what they've been the, yeah. their whole time and yada yada yada. Um uh, so there's that. But then there's people like Hanji, who I feel like should be a a great voice and beacon for everyone, because she loves technological advancement and the Marlians have brought her so much to work with. Um, her staring down the barrel of that gun gave me so much anxiety. So much anxiety. <laughs> please, don't do that. please don't do that, please don't do that. But like, she's never seen it before. And so I was just like, oh, look at her. She's happy. That was happy. such a sweet scene too. I love that. When they were sitting, when they were having the tea and she's like, oh my God, like freaking out. Like we we're just talking about just her. She's so passionate about all of this. And Levi's like, chill the hell out. And she's like, oh my God, what is this? You guys have ships? You guys have planes? Like, yeah. yeah. Great scene. Great See, scene. Even when she's at her darkest, I feel like she brightens up the scene. I don't know what, mm-hmm. once again, it's a, it's, it's a very well wit- written sci- scientific character that I'm just a huge mm-hmm. fan of. Wait, so you think that there's going to be some sort of civil unrest between the Eldians before some shit goes down with the rest of the world? I actually think it's going to happen during. During? Okay. I I mean, that's what it seems like has kind of been happening. You know what Mm -hmm. I'm saying? Like how we were talking about Aaron and Zeke might both be for the LDN people, but yet they've been kind of fighting each other this whole time. Both sides have been fighting each other, trying to fight the world. Like they're Mm -hmm. both trying to get enough power to move forward. But it's like, y'all just work. Like, I, I really hope that at this point, you know, the plan is to work together. 
I really hope they just work together. But the people of Paradise Island are really having to swallow, swallow a lot. Like even Levi's, all of his aggressions towards Zeke are warranted. Like literally all of Levi's Mm -hmm. friends and everyone, except for Hanji really, have Mm -hmm. been slaughtered, you know? Like he didn't Mm -hmm. even meet um, Armin and Aaron and all of them until they became scouts and he was pretty much forced to take care of Aaron and to watch out for him and all of that Mm -hmm. stuff. But like before that, you know, he had a totally different group. He had a totally different, uh, what is it called? Squad? Squad? Squad. Yes. Had a totally different squad. And they all got, I mean, annihilated. And he put work on them. (laughs) Put work on them. (laughs) And he said, she literally was swatting them like flies. Oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, but you know, there's just there's this thing that has just been in my mind and it's facing your fate. Aaron, like I said, the moment when Aaron's like, you know, this is inevitable. Um, we are these monsters that people keep talking about. Yeah, we might not be wanting to actually kill everybody and we might not use our Titan ability to off people, but we do have this, we do have this ability. And I mean, at the end of the day, okay, so this this is what I'm going to say about Aaron. At the end of the day, I feel like he's right. Literally, Willie Tiber just said, we need to kill Aaron Yeager and the people of Paradise Island, Aaron Yeager, are our enemy. They are our main enemy, and that is what it is, right? So Mm -hmm. even if he didn't pop out, if he did not pop out under the stage and cause all that ruckus, eventually people were going to be coming for them. Like Willie Tiber literally just told the entire world, we are declaring war against these Eldians Um, or I guess, you know, the people of Paradise Island. Now it might've been taking some time. Mm -hmm. It might've been, you know, a year, maybe two years before anything really went down, but the way Zeke was rearing up. Well, I mean, I guess now we know maybe Zeke Mm -hmm. wasn't going to infiltrate. I don't know, but the way things were going, it seemed like things were going to happen soon. Now, should he have gone about it like that? putting the scouts in that type of predicament, like, here's the plan, y'all gonna help me or not, like, that is ridiculous. And that was so uncalled for and not literally, like, at all, at all. Um, No. (laughs) I'm sorry, it was a dick. Yeah, no, it was, it was. Um, But I just really am like, he's really descending into madness for real. Like, just seeing him in that final scene and... Oh, also, I I noticed this too. In all the scenes, all the flashbacks we're getting of, mm-hmm. you know, Armin, Mikasa. I didn't even really expect Mikasa to be a part of any of this either. But seeing all of them uh, interact with the Marleans and like getting to know them and getting to know the technology, the food, the people, all of that stuff. All of them are in those scenes. Mikasa is there, mm-hmm. Sasha, Connie, Hanji, Leva, everybody, right? Aaron is in not one of those scenes except mm-hmm. for when he is shooting that gun. Aaron, I feel like in Aaron's head, he's just like, I am straight up in war mode right now. Like they're talking, like, I think it was a scene where um, he's practicing like his shots or whatever. And Armin's kind of like, yeah, like the Marlins are really opening up to us. Things were hard at first, but now things are getting better. And then (laughs) this man, (laughs) this man Aaron said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Have you seen Berto's memories yet or what? Like he's literally like, He's like, you saw the memories or what, my guy? We don't got time for this. Like, what, what what's going on? I'm like, uh, yeah. Uh, also, to that scene, I think Armin's lying about what he sees in Berto's memories. Ooh, I feel that. I mm. feel like he's lying. I feel like he's like, yeah, nothing can really help us. He knows it can help us, but he also knows that Aaron has gone. Aaron has crossed to the other side, right? Um, to make an unfair comparison. I feel like Aaron should have took on more of a winter soldier type role. And yeah, everyone's coming to kill, like everyone's going to come to kill me. All right, disappear out into the wind. Like this is the life. Like, you know, you only have a set amount of life to live anyway. So like if their war is with him, then make it about, like if you're going to start a war and make it about you on your decisions, then make it about you fully and go off into the wind. But you he feel knows like he could have friend. protected Paradise Island by leaving? Mm-hmm. I do. I it's it's not the exact same thing, mm-hmm. but 
in a that's what the Winter Soldier did with Steve, right? Yeah. Like he was yeah. just like, I'm damaged goods and I'm no good for anyone. Let me just distance myself from this team of people that have on more than one occasion showed that they were there for me. Uh, and he was doing great until he was framed for terrorist activities, but that's neither here nor there. Um, I feel like it's the same thing for Aaron though. Like he, mm-hmm. he could have, if he knew this was about him, right? And knew this was about like his ideal or anything like that. He could have just, like there, there was more than one way to save parody and I get it. He's a teenager throughout all of this. I think right now, like in season four, are they 19 or 16? I think right now they're like 19 or 20. Okay. Because I mean, I don't know how old they were when everything happened, but from when everything happened, it was five years and then they were scouts mm -hmm. and then it's now been four years. So I always guess that they were about 10, 11 when stuff first went down. So Mm -hmm. in my head, they're like 19, 20, 21. Okay. (laughs) All right. That's, that's where I guess everyone's head process, like thought process was for some reason, I thought they were seven when his mom and dad were killed. Were they? They could have been. This and I, just, I don't I don't know. But I just know like either way, their frontal cortex isn't fully developed, is where I'm getting at. Um so right. his decision making is very much that of let's give him the benefit of the doubt and say a 19 or 20 year old. And I think back mm-hmm. to myself when I was 19 or 20, and I was selfish living in a life of compared to what he's living in, luxury, right? I mean, I was in college figuring things out but I was still like you know like nowhere near was I like a in war Mm -hmm. or you know anything like that so I feel like he's he's thought this through the best he can but I think there's still that childlike hope of there is hope for someone and Mm -hmm. that someone is going to be my people so I think that's what's driving his decision making and you know in season one when He's having to make these hard decisions and Levi's like, basically like, trust yourself. I mean, no one can make these decisions for you. Either you're going to follow what we tell you to do, or you're going to go off of your own instinct. And Mm -hmm. I feel like he's taken that and went way overboard with it. Like, he's like, I hear y'all, but I'm not hearing y'all. You know what I'm saying? I hear you, but I don't hear you. I'm going to do what I want to do. And Levi calls him out on that in the hearing room or the courtroom or whatever. And he's like, you knew this and you didn't tell anyone? He was like, well, I was worried about right. Historia turning Historia into a Titan. No, in full well, no one was going to turn Historia into a Titan. Like, right. no one was going to turn Historia into a Titan. I felt like that was a quick, like, BS line he came up with. And all of it, because he's gone off the deep end, I feel like he's completely manip- trying to manipulate everyone around him. So you I don't even so? know. I don't think I... As much as Zeke is for himself, I think Aaron is for himself, but masquerading it as I am for the LDN people, I'm for my friends. And the reason why I think that, and this goes into a topic you brought up in the older episode where you were trying to figure out time Mm -hmm. and like how it works in um, this world and I think back to when uh, Grisha and the owl were on top of the ledge of parody. And the owl starts mentioning Mikasa and Armin and all these things. And I'm like, is he having a premonition of what the future is? And he's trying to help like implant in Grisha's mind, like continue, continue to think about other people and not just yourself. because he can see for some reason the owl can see whatever the attack titans true powers are he they're able to see into the future um or if it's like a specific bloodline because falco can do the same thing right where he talked about like i was dreaming i was flying in the air like odm gear like with odm gear man so so i clearing it up because I was in some sort of um I was in like a little group chat and we were talking about that and somebody else brought that up like was um was Aaron manipulating Falco's like thoughts you mm-hmm. know with the founding titan power but I don't think that's true I think that you're right I feel like he also had a premonition that's so that's so interesting okay yeah okay so that moment though on the 
Okay, that moment, yeah. the owl. So the owl, I think, I think the owl is a lot stronger than what we know of him. And I think he had somehow, uh, taking the premonition a step further, I felt like he could control his premonition. Like, not really to control it, but like, jump forward into memories because he even okay. says like whose memories are whose memories are my remembering right he's and like so, i don't know whose memories those are okay but that's fucked up there these people's heads are like he's hearing memories from people you don't even know like oh yeah. okay so this is my tinfoil hat theory i think that owl knew aaron was going to descend into this madness this darkness or whatever and that was his warning to grisha to raise a child to make sure to anchor themselves not just in himself but into those around him oh. to care about other people mm. and in this scene i think this is aaron masquerading as caring about other people oh i don't i didn't want anything bad to happen to historia that's not true because he the power was activated when you touched her so all you had to do was quite Let's literally touch, touch her. her thank you and see that's if it would work saying. So, and he's done all this like master planning and all this other stuff before. So he has to know that. Like he has to know that. And so in my head, I'm like, uh uh, Aaron's not, he's not the protagonist we think he is. Mm -hmm. There is there's something more to him. There's something more to this descent in darkness and where he's living right now in his mind's eye that he's not letting on just yet. And that's what I want to know. I want to know where really is Aaron's mind because everyone else is of the mind that like, oh, he's doing the best for all Eldians. No, he's not. That's a selfish Okay, breath. That's how I feel about him. Selfish breath. To that point, all right, bear with me here. And correct me if I'm wrong because I've been thinking about this all week since, since the episode before this and People keep not mentioning the Attack Titan, right? Mm -hmm. They keep saying Paradise Island has the Colossal and the Founding Titan, and that's why people are attacking Marley. You know, Zeke's like, I got to go retrieve the Founding Titan. You had the Colossal Titan. They don't ever mention that Paradise Island has the Attack Titan as well, right? And then not only that, though, when I think back to the Owl, he was the Attack Titan, did Marley not know that there was an attack Titan? Marley feels like they have all of the Titans, right? So mm -hmm. do people not know about this attack Titan? That just kind of popped into my head. And so like, is that a thing? Have they meant other than Grisha's notes about the owl telling him about the attack Titan and him giving them him the Titan? I was kind of thinking like, is this Titan kind of a secret? Because, you know, in Marley's head again, they have mm -hmm. all the Titans. They don't want any of their Titans to die because if a Titan uh, variant dies, you know, they're born into a random person, a new person. So I'm kind of like, was it that they had the attack Titan and then maybe it died and it did go to a random person or I'm confused by that because where did they think the attack Titan was when the owl had him? That's a great question. And you're right. I, in, my, in my thought process, I wouldn't send something as valuable as the attack Titan for a simp simple, you know, for all intents and purposes, like a dump and kill mission, right? Right. They didn't know that he was the attack Titan. Like he just, he slit his thing and literally popped out and they were like, what yeah. the hell? Yeah. So I'm just, I'm kind of like, that has kind of had me stuck because I feel almost like the attack Titan is a secret, a secret Titan. Cause they keep just saying like Aaron Yeager stole the founding Titan. And I think I kind of was glossing over that because mm -hmm. the founding Titan for me is, I mean, the most important Titan. I think for most of the world, for most of the show, everyone's mm -hmm. like, where's the founding Titan? Where's the founding Titan? So at first I wasn't thinking much about them not bringing up the attack Titan at all, but I'm like, I mean, that time is pretty important too. Like, let's not forget that <laughs> Grisha, you know, they're saying that Grisha stole the Founding Titan. And I'm like, how do they think that he stole the Founding Titan if he wasn't, you know, the Attack Titan as well? But mm -hmm. I don't know. I, I need to rewatch some of those scenes where they kind of brought that up. But I feel like that's going to play a role in this too. And I don't really know because of the whole memory things with the Attack mm -hmm. Titan, how Aaron's mind could be working. But yeah, I'm, I'm interested to see. I really want to see how every single Titan variant feels about 
what's going on, you know, their position in this war, how the female Titan, what her, what the memories are that she's had, you know, are, are most of the Titans really just tools of war and kind of just did what they had to do? Or did they have actual, like, how, um, what's his name, how the founding Titan was against war. And now that whole thing is ingrained in every single person that has the founding Titan. That's kind of where my thought was with the beast Titan. Like maybe the beast Titan has a different perspective on things. And just like how Armin, not Armin, Era as Armin, like, have you seen Bertolt's memories? Like how is the colossal Titan like formed and shaped? So I don't know that that's really also what I'm super interested to see how that all plays out and I mean like will we even really know because at this point are all those things becoming parts of everybody's personality um Mm -hmm. I mean I guess you can say Bertolt and Armin were sort of similar ish in a way you know kind of like softer spoken guys kind of just there for their friends probably don't really want to be killing anybody but yeah yeah I I'm I agree with you on that I think there's a a line of for the colossal titan overall i think historically we're gonna find out that they are more pacifists or not necessarily pacifists but like they're nukes they're literally nukes (laughs) yeah so i i find that interesting so i think uh, something's got to happen with annie because she's also at the end of her life too Mm -hmm. so i don't know if the crystal's gonna break first and then she dies I don't know if they're going to try and transfer into someone else. Don't know what's going to happen. I really quickly to just brush on Sasha's ignorance of black people. <laughs> I appreciated. Um, I forget it. Oy, oy, oh, what's his name? I don't oy, know how to um, say his name, but it's like, wait, let me find yeah. it. Um, Oyan Kapoon. Oh, yes. So I'm calling him Onyan. Um, Onyan. Uh, his tact in answering the question, because you can tell he was educated on parody in that Absolutely. that they've no black people went there. And it goes back to uh, Mikasa's whole storyline of like not a lot of Asian families went with them, e- went with the founding family either. Mm-hmm. Um, or the founding Titan. Royal family founding Titan. Uh, so he, because he knew that, he found a very clever way to break it down and explain to her on the spot. Absolutely. I loved it. I literally wrote that down. Like that was the most perfect way I think they could have handled that situation. In that mm-hmm. moment, I was like, oh God, what, he about to, what, the, what are they about to have this chocolate brother say to her right now? What are they about to say? And why but is it I, Sasha that has to get dragged? No. <laughs> I really love Sasha. You know what? I will say I felt like there was an innocence in that. And I mm-hmm. I feel like it had to be Sasha. I just think mm-hmm. nobody else would ask. Nobody else would. Maybe Hanji. Maybe Hanji would have found a better way to ask. But mm-hmm. he, that to me was excellent writing. Him being like, you know what? God said we need a little bit more spice. And I'm here. You here. Go. here you <laughs> and go. that's all I need to say. He created some more people. That's it. That's all there is to it. And that that was good and even him being like you know that's what I believe aren't people free to believe what they want like that whole scene I was like oh I'm feeling him I'm digging him I love that and Attack on Titan handled that situation perfectly because I know that they were probably thinking like oh the viewers are wondering we just brought a black person into the show we have to like should we say something (laughs) should we address it somehow well I, that was my mm, that was my initial gripe with the show. Uh, I remember when I first started binging this, and you asked about my like feelings on it, and I said, "Well, the reason why it took me so long to get into it is because all the characters, and initially, all the characters are crafted out of a white image, and I always looked for anime to kind of take me out of that, which sounds weird when I talk about Dragon Ball Z being one of my first anime." because they specifically get power-ups when they turn um, blonde hair, green eyes. But we don't have to get into the psychosis oh, of it Oh, dang. I don't even get into that. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Um, but that, in and of itself, where I was just like, and they purposely stated, like, in the show, right? Like, there's, like, all the, like, because when they talk about Mikasa, they're like, all the, the Asian race has been completely wiped out, da, 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 da. and I was just like, mm-hmm. this is exhausting. Like, I don't 
I don't want to have like if you're gonna tackle this and do it this way, like it just seems very placating so white image. And I was just like, I don't want to deal with this. And then as the show progressed and you start to realize like, oh no, 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 these were these separate group of people that very specific situations happen to, and there is a whole world out there, and this isn't mm-hmm. the whole world. And that kind of walks me back from like, and this is why we give storytelling a chance. <laughs> Precisely, precisely. This is why we get storytelling chat. So yeah. Nice. I, um, but yeah, I I thought that was handled with grace and tax and a lot of other things. I I do have feelings I want to say about Armin talking to Annie. I mm-hmm. feel like I feel like historically the colossal titan and the female titan have a close relationship. Oh yeah. And so I feel like there is something there in the way of not like him like pining after her or anything like that, but just needing someone to confide in. And she quite literally has, rather, I'm sure she knows it and was very in tune with her powers, but uh, she was very in tune with like the colossal, how do I want to phrase this? Like there is a relationship, a historical relationship between the two and they are right. connected. And that is who he is choosing to confide in because he has Bertolt's memories and the colossal Titan's memories. So. Do you think I, that she can hear him in her crystal? Yes. And the reason why I think she can is because when the Warhammer Titan was being eaten. Oh, right it looked like she was reacting to Aaron. <laughs> right. Problem solving his way to eating her. Um, so I, I think she can't hear him. And I, Annie played cold hearted because she knew cold hearted was how the job got done. Mm-hmm. I do think she, like there is a part of her that cares, but I also think there's a part of her that fully recognizes she was being manipulated. And so she was just, dealing with the circumstances as they were. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think Annie's heart is not in war or any of this at all. I think she definitely was just a tool and she knows that. And I think she just really cares about getting home. And I mean, I think that she, even more so than Bertolt or Reiner, I feel like low key really has a a really big soft spot for all of the scouts and all of those people. And like you said, I think she was just playing this cold role because she has, she's had to, you know, mm-hmm. this whole time. Um, I really hope that she breaks that crystal and comes out and joins the squad because I love, <laughs> I love her character so much. I want the female Titan to bust out and fight alongside them so badly, but yeah. Um, one of the so one of the last things I want to talk about was man, Aaron makes a statement saying Zeke must have found a way to bypass the founding Titans vow against war. Okay, I don't know about all that, but then he starts. <laughs> I'm like, I don't know how the B side would have done that, but or how Zeke would have done that, but mm-hmm. then he starts talking about the rumbling and how it's the only way if we threaten this rumbling, it is the only way to get people off our backs basically but I'm kind of like what do you mean have the world has not already known about this like I can't remember didn't Willie t- like the world has known that these do they know that these titans are in the walls or is it just like certain people know like Willie and higher ups know Willie revealed it in his speech right and you're right Willie revealed it in his speech so he's saying like we need to take down the founding titan before he finds a way to activate the titans in the wall right. but Okay. I'm glad you brought up the vow because I completely forgot about the vow. And the vow is what takes over the um and, and the royalty, right? Because it's the mm-hmm. it's the founding titans' will that takes over, right? And they should never want war. But because Aaron had the attack titan, mm-hmm. he, and he's not royalty. So yeah, he's not royalty. So the founding titan has no pull over him to wow. I'm just like you bring up the vow and me remembering back to saying like once they once a family member a royal family member eats the titan they truly become the founding titan right um that's so i'm like zeke can't zeke can't eat aaron right i mean unless he thinks he's strong enough to not fall into that but i mean no one has been so 
<laughs> I'm like, I feel like, you know, I don't know what Zeke's plan is. Like, and, and that's another thing. I was confused. Is Aaron saying that Zeke, they think Zeke's plan is to actually activate the rumbling? Or is it to just say that together, me and Aaron can activate the rumbling? Thus, y'all need to leave us alone. I like, think which Z- one was- I think Zeke and Aaron want to activate the rumbling. I, think, I feel that. I feel like Aaron's team. Let's get it. Let's get it going. <laughs> get all. You the we have how many colossal titans? Yep. <laughs> Send them on marching right across the sea. They don't even need to be on ships or anything. They can walk right across the sea. Literally, Aaron's face, like when they were in the little, um, like when they're in the courtroom, wherever they mm-hmm. were, and they're reading this out loud. Aaron's face literally looked like, "Oh shit, that's right. That's what we need to do." So I would not be surprised if that's not how everything ends. I mean, I don't know. I don't see what's going to help the LDNs at this point other than something really extreme like that because they have, the world has a reason to be afraid. Now, in my the back of my mind, I also think though, no one wants to be a Titan. You know what I'm saying? No mm-hmm. one's going to willingly turn themselves into a titan so the most people have to be afraid of are to me the shapeshifters the ones that can go back and forth and okay has it already been discussed has it already been discussed the possibility of spreading out the shapeshifters as in giving different countries different ones has that already been discussed has that ever been a thing i don't think it has I don't think it, I don't think it's been discussed. I don't think anyone's brought it up like as like a, a bargaining chip or something like that. Yeah, because I'm like, how that also else? how does I my question is though is like don't you need an Eldian there in order like only an Eldian can turn into a Titan, right? Mm-hmm. That, okay, so are we saying like the different Eldians in different countries, but like how do you know their loyalties won't go back to just Eldians versus country? It becomes like a people That's over country type situation so real. like yeah. i don't know like it, it's man we over here trying to i'm over here trying to <laughs> trying to solve the ldn dilemma right now talking about how do we do this how do we keep them from not killing everybody but literally i don't see any other option i mean i don't know this episode for me solidifies that there has to be a lot more death and mm-hmm. I'm not emotionally ready for that. I don't Yeah, I already know. feel like Attack on Titan has taken a very I mean, it was always a dark show, but it has really mm-hmm. taken a very bleak, a bleak turn. Because originally, you know, it was A versus B, and let's just mm-hmm. see what happens there. And I would have been fine if season four would have been A against B. Paradise mm-hmm. Island versus Marley. Now it's literally A against B C D. B against C like it's really just it's a lot and it's very bleak for me right now I can't lie um yeah any last thoughts before we get Um, into predictions uh what else is there what else is there not really I'm interested I'm interested to see what Pixis does next like I feel like he's been holding back a lot in the courtroom scene. Uh, yes, he was giving like very subtle commentary that calmed everyone. But I'm interested to see what he does next. Cause he can't just be listening to Aaron and Levi and be like, that sounds like, like Pixis has demonstrated on more than one occasion. Like you all are 10 steps ahead, but I'm 50. I, I don't know. I don't, I feel like he's him and Hanji, I feel like are anchoring points for this universe, or at least the for the people in parody mm-hmm. are anchoring points for people and voices of reason. So I think this goes into a prediction. So I'll, I'll let you go first for predictions, but this goes, in, my next thought goes into a prediction. So yeah. Um, man, I don't even freaking know. I think that, oh, last thought before that though, I feel so bad for Gabby and freaking, uh, Falco, I can't lie, them poor kids. Gabby has gone off the deep end for real. Like, she is like literally PTSD. Like, I'm just like, that was kind of sad to see. And I, you know, I'm not even like anti-Gabby or pro-Gabby for real. Um, 
I just, I, that was kind of heartbreaking. So I'm like, dang, the cycle never ends. <laughs> like mm-hmm. These kids are just traumatized for forever. Literally um, traumatized. I, uh, yeah, I, she killed, she killed Sasha. So I felt some type of way, but mm-hmm. she's also like 12. So what can I really feel? You know what I'm saying? She's been brainwashed since birth and it's poor baby, sweet baby poor angle. Baby. She's just there biting her nails, talking about Aaron Yeager, like, dang. Um, so I think it's interesting they have Zeke in this little, this forest. Um, I want to know, next episode, are we going to get the expedition you're talking about? Are we going to get them listening to Zeke's plan and then going ahead and executing it? Are we going to get somebody going off the deep end and going off like Aaron you know is Aaron gonna veer off I mean you know the last scene is him brushing his hair back I don't know what you know what he's about to get ready to do uh but yeah I really I just don't even know like usually I have a solid I think this is gonna happen I really don't know but I do think that you're right that either the rumbling is gonna get halfway activated or somebody like it's just gonna Mm -hmm. straight up happen um so from a diplomatic side, I think next episode I need, I would like to see, or, or, or my thing is, is it's uh, Pixis or Hanji's declaration for peace is what I'm calling it. Um, like a, their approach to a more sensible way of interacting. Like, yeah, we're going to fight Marley because we have to fight Marley. But as there's their more sensible approach for the rest of the world. Um, I don't think Yelena is going to be down with that. I think Yelena plays a bigger part. It never fails. When you introduce someone like this, they always play a bigger part. So her and Oyon, I think, are going to come back in a big way. I I think the conversation between Zeke and Aaron happens, but not with, like, Levi's permission, as I'm going to call it. I think it's going to be... Aaron sneaking off, like you said, veering off and then talking to Zeke and hashing out their plan. I think uh, Levi is going to be quote unquote spying on them so he can get uh, like a heads up. And I think Armin and Mikasa are going to start having to make tough decisions. I think Aaron's putting them in tight spaces and I think they're going to have to make tough decisions. And I think Jean is going to be that reliable, sensible, smart leader that talks the rest of the scouts to follow Levi, but while still trying to talk down Levi from being ready to kill Aaron and Zeke on sight, I think that's who he's going to be. Um, so where I, where we saw Armin being technically the next Irwin, mm-hmm. it, I think it's Jean mm. being more of the Irwin S type commander type person and Armin has to become, Armin's going to be stuck, Armin and Mikasa are going to be somewhere stuck in the middle. I think the next episode is still going to be fairly diplomatic with a little bit more espionage going on. I don't think we're going to have any big, like, huge Titan fight or anything like that. Mm-hmm. I think the next episode after this one, we're going to get that expedition in whatever capacity it looks like. I want his story to be more involved. Mm-hmm. I hope she does end up some way being more involved. Uh, I don't know. And I think Gabby's going to do something else stupid. And I don't I don't see Gabby. I don't think Gabby makes it to the end of the series. I, I'm interested to see what happens with Falco, especially because of the whole, premon- my whole premonition thing theory. I'm interested to see what happens with him. I want to say he eats Zeke. I feel the same way. I totally feel the same way. Like I, man, you literally took that right out of my heart. <laughs> and I totally feel like this man is gonna eat Zeke. And mm-hmm. who? What an interesting, what an interesting beast titan that would, that would be. Okay, now I'm having other thoughts. Okay, I'm gonna just, I'm gonna close it. Yep, up. go ahead. Um, <laughs> No, no, we're going too far, we're going too far. Um, yeah, I think we will get to see Aaron and Zeke talking. You know, now that you bring up Historia, it would be 
interesting to see Historia and Zeke meet two royal, mm-hmm. two royal folks with that bloodline. Um, what their interaction would be, what happens when they touch each other? Shoot, you know, like what would he get if he touched Historia? I don't know. <laughs> um, <laughs> So, yeah, I'm really excited for this next episode. I feel like this is a great, we're at a great point in the series. And whether the series completely actually ends at the end of these 16 episodes or whether we get a movie, whatever else, I feel like, I feel like I will be decently resolved because (laughs) I'm getting to the point of like, what are their options and I need to know them now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like we need to get to this. We need to know what the Elden, del- how are we about to solve this now? So. Yeah. Yeah. But all right, Duncan, thank you for joining me. This has been a great convo. Um, let the people know where they can find you and listen to your wonderful podcast. Cool. Um, first of all, thank you for having me. I've been waiting just like hope she sends an invite i hope she sends an invite i want to talk i want to talk so thank you so much for having me uh you guys can, you guys can find me on instagram at runs underscore on underscore duncan underscore it's important to put that third underscore in there because if you don't i think you like get sent to like a puppy page or something like that it's someone's <laughs> dog or something or like some girl that hasn't posted in like years i forget which one it is but yeah you can find me there um you can also find my podcast page on instagram at rot underscore pod that's w-r-a-w-t underscore p-o-d uh i have like i think six seven episodes up now and hopefully by the end of this week we'll have a little bit more um <laughs> so go ahead we're on spotify apple Podcasts, google Podcasts, most places where you get podcasts and uh check me out you can always find the podcast by searching my name or searching where we watching and we're talking nice and i will put all the links to all of that good stuff in the description box again thank you duncan and if you guys want to get more on attack on titan or all things anime make sure you guys check me out at the underscore anime nay and continue listening to big titan talk you guys it's it's been great um this is episode 10 i've loved every second of it Woohoo! yes episode 10 um so yeah hopefully i see you guys back for episode 11 bye